are David. They call me T.R. affectionately in India. Sometimes they call me T.R. David. Doesn't matter what my name is, I was born and brought up in India. I went to law schools in India, also graduated from the University of Delhi for my bachelor's in the year 1966. 66 to 68, I was I studied law from the Faculty of Law for two and a half years. At the time, I got married to my first wife, who is also from Kotem uh, District Care. We we went to first England. I worked there for Her Majesty's government as a post and telegraph officer and my wife for, wife worked for the Prince of Wales Hospital in London. After working there for seven years, I moved to America, the land of opportunities, where I ran into a lot of discrimination issues, not one, one after the other. Let me start with that first. Then I will take you step by step what happened to me at the age of 84 now. This is recorded today, April 3, 2024 in India. The reason why I wanted to speak to all of you is to let you know how the American system functions, what they call in America a system of checks and balances. It means each organ of the government has co-equal powers. The judiciary controls the administration and the legislative branch. And legislative branch controls the other organs. So each organ of the government controls the function of the other. Okay? I want you to give a broad outline. I am not a legal expert, but I have a lot of years of experience fighting the damn system in America. What happened was when I went to USA in a plane, not like people coming to America in a boat in a back door, we got an immigrant visa to enter the United States of America. So I and my wife and three daughters who were all born British, we moved to Detroit, Michigan. I started working for a company called Michigan Bell Telephone Company, which was then one of the subsidiaries of AT&T. AT&T was the giant at that time. They still are. But they had changed their lot of things which I am going to come to you. When in Detroit, I happened to work for a manager by the name Mr. Temple, who was watching all of us who have come from other countries remotely, what you do? They can watch every floor, everything, they got such a top technology at that time. I'm talking in the year 1973. Okay. So, after watching me a few days, he called me and said, Mr. David, come and tell me what your education, what your experience and everything. I explained to them, to him, Mr. Temple, my background. He was very pleased. He told me, I told him during the discussion, I had worked as a secretary for a company in India by the name New India Assurance Company in New Delhi in India. Oh, he said to me, Mr. David, we have 600 secretaries, all of them are females. So we'd love to have you. He sent me for a test, a three hours test, which I finished in an hour and a half. And later on, 
<coughs> he said, Mr. David, I am going to schedule you for an interview with a division manager. His name was David Bartz, B-A-R-T-Z. He didn't know I am a male or a dark-skinned male of Indian origin. He thought I may be a traditional woman. He was surprised to find a male as his secretary. He doesn't want it. He consulted the legal department. They told him, Mr. Bartz, you have to hire Mr. David if he met the qualifications required for a secretary when 10th grade was sufficient. I have a bachelor's and nearly three years of law studies. I didn't finish my LLB final year uh, because I got married, as I told you, we moved to England and then England to America. So Mr. Temple sent me to this guy by the name David Bartz and he had no option but to hire me as his secretary. Really, he doesn't want me but he had no option but to hire me. After working for this guy for a five so I'm going to begin again. I was sent to work for this guy, Mr. David Bards, who had to accept me as his secretary, but after working for him for a period of five days, he said I am not fit to do his job. He demoted me, sent me back to the department I was working because of discrimination based on my color of my skin, my national origin, mainly at that time. I went and filed a complaint against Mr. Bartz with the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, although we had one in the company itself, that is called EEO, Internal EEO. But they said we can't investigate this guy because he's a division manager. So I went to the outside agency who found the employer guilty of discrimination and ordered them to reinstate me. And based on the orders of the EEOC then, they paid me a nominal compensation and I was sent to work for two division managers, two district managers. One is a German, one is a French. They found me shortly thereafter. I'm way overqualified. So I was sent to work for two division managers. One is by the name Hank Hudson, and the other one is a Bob Cooper, who is a black. Hank Hudson was a natural born American. While working for them, Mr. Hudson recommended I take a management assessment program, they call it MAP, which was for three days. And in the competitive test, I passed in flying colors, securing 100 marks out of 10 hundred in each ten different areas, top mark. But at I mean Michigan Bell, refused to promote me and send me three years of management training, intensive management training, as was done to other similarly qualified persons. Second discrimination, one led to the other. She was my immediate supervisor. She said, Mr. David, we have an opportunity for you to work for our then parent company, at and in Orlando, Florida. Are you interested in? Yes, yes, ma'am. So she gave me a first class ticket by Delta Air, I remember that. I started there from April 1, 1979. That was a five-year agreement. Once the period is over, I am supposed to be returned back to Michigan Bell, where I was originally working. At the time, we were 1,500 people defending an action 
brought against AT&T by the U.S. Department of Justice to break up their monopoly. So, two and a half years later, I was getting every six months a merit increase because I started at the lowest level. While others were getting higher pay, I being promoted, I was getting low salary. So I, I continued to get every six months a merit increase. And the last merit increase was given to me sometime in August, uh, first week, I can't remember the exact date. And a week later, I was called for a meeting and they offered me, the manager of uh, Michigan Bell, $35,000 to quit the job. I said, sir, I don't want it. I got small children, then aged three, seven, nine, and twelve. My son was born in New York while I'm working there. Uh, then he raised the, the offer to $45,000. So I said to Mr. Stone, sir, I don't want the money because I got small children. The company provides a lot of uh, benefits, fringe benefits, life insurance, medical, dental, free phone, a lot of things. So I said, I don't want that offer, sir. Then he fired me in the invited presence of my first wife, Cicely Day, at a Royal Plaza Hotel in Disney World, Orlando, Florida. They fired it without any cause. The at and is a federal contractor. They are required to follow the federal contractor compliance program, which they refused. They were also required to, under the IRS Regulation 10.4, to give you notice. They were also required, under the Older Workers Act time, they didn't follow any of the rules. Okay. Now, the termination was illegal in violation of the age discrimination because I was over the age of 40. It is also in violation of all the laws on the books. Major corporations think they can do whatever they want because they have the support of the administration. At that time, President Reagan was elected and a Catholic priest by the name Raymond J. Donovan, he was nominated as Secretary of Labor who wanted to bust the unions, the, the wanted to encourage child labor, paying them 15 cents an hour. 15 cents, young guys, young kids, and he busted unions. The only company that benefited most was at and Soon after Mr. Donovan took office, he did all these things beneficial to at and So there was a lot of turmoil in the workplace. Later on, this Catholic priest, he got married uh, to a woman. I have her name, I can't remember now. He is from a family of twelve, six boys, six girls. So he went to become a priest so that he can give them money, charity. So that's a long story. My case, my case moved purely on political basis, purely, not in, 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 in conformity with the laws on the books then. So what happened was the EEOC refused to investigate my illegal discrimination. There is no basis. They deemed a release I was supposed to execute as final. They have no authority under the law to deem a document submitted by them whether I signed it under, under duress, coercion and fraud, or voluntary. Okay. 
So what happened was this corporation hired a woman. Her name is Aan C. Kanvi. She was working then for a law firm in Tampa, Florida by the name Carlton Field, Emanuel Cutler and Smith. The purpose was she was previously, <coughs> three years before, worked for the federal judge John A. Reed Jr. We thought that Reed is a honorable man. They moved the court to dismiss my case, the defendant. The case was assigned to Judge Reed under case number 82200 ORL CIVR or for Reed. Then the defendant deployed other tactics. The purpose of hiring this woman, Ansi Conway, was to unduly influence the judge to render a decision in their favor, which he declined. Then I had engaged a lawyer by the name Syriac D. Kapil from Kerala, India, who was practicing at that time in Chicago, Cook County. They offered him a judicial position, which he declined. They also offered him some plum cases to handle on their behalf, which he declined. He was murdered later on in a untotally, as I heard later on, five years later, he was murdered. I don't know whether at and had any secret deals in his murder. And two judges at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals were also murdered. One was bombed and murdered by one Moody. Moody was a guy with a lot of money. He had his own plane and everything. So they arrested him and he was executed, giving lethal injection. The other judge, possibly, who disagreed with AT&T, he was, his name was uh, Mr. His name was, I forgot the name, I will put it later. He was found dead in his bedroom with his gun. Okay, that is still a mystery. Now, I went through the whole process. Finally, I moved to the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, in a case, in Ray Terracotto, Case number 16-9624 granted me permission to file a writ of mandamus. That's the case number. Now, all the people involved, they were all players. The Supreme Court's orders were ignored contumaciously, arbitrarily, and capriciously by the chief clerk. Uh, Mr. Scott, Scott, uh, Scott Harris. Okay, now what I'm going to show to you is how the system, the corrupt system, functioned in America. Now I'm going to read from these various appendices how the things moved. Okay, number one talks about a release that I was forced to sign under duress to feed my children. Under duress, coercion and through fraud on August 25, 1981, while in Michigan. Okay. I got a letter from the to sue at and and Michigan Bell that is called a right to sue letter. EEOC letter dated April 12, 1982. Then, number three, appendix three, is an amended complaint filed by my counsel, Surya Kapil. And 
there were a lot of things happened. The judge was meeting this woman and she convey at her home, his home, to fix the case. I smelt a rat and Judge Reed was forced to recuse and resign from the bench. Okay, in disgrace. That is Appendix 4. Then, under the scheme, you have to understand, it's all a scheme. The case was transferred by Judge Reed to his chosen successor by the name Terrell William Hodges of Tampa Division. The, Tampa, the court of Tampa had no jurisdiction at all to hear a case that is going on in Orlando. The Orlando District Court at that time had five judges. They don't want to give it to him because they know it and he knows very well. If the case goes to one of them, they will have a very tough time to prove I quit the job. The contention of at and was I quit the job. Okay? So it's a question of facts which has to go to the jury. They don't want a jury trial. They want the court to decide the case based on papers. The Supreme Court has repeatedly held when there are tribal issues of material facts exist in a case, no judgment can be granted on a motion. The Supreme Court had held three succeeding cases in 60, 1968, I believe. So they are the standard. Now, Judge Reed transferred the case to Hodges of Tampa to fix the case. Now, what they did was the case based on Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and ADA was never tried before the court. In the meantime, at and created a case law saying that you have to pay back the money to the employer before I can sue. Okay. Once the court issued that order, which is a per curiam unpublished order issued by the Michigan State Court, the defendants brought a copy of the same and moved Hodges to dismiss the case. And Hodges, without conducting any hearing as required under the rules, dismissed the case as a dismissal without prejudice. No hearing, no trial, I was served, no papers at all. There is no such procedure in America. You never met this guy, Hodges, except 10 minutes. How he can make a finding of facts when I never filed any papers, never had a hearing before him. So he issued an order to dismiss the case as without prejudice. It's a technical term, without prejudice. And the clerk of the court, one Donald Brown, altered the court's order as a dismissal on the merit. The judge's order is to dismiss the case without prejudice. The clerk of the court, Donald Brown, altered this as on the merit, which has a different meaning. Donald Brown was subsequently prosecuted. He was fired. He was an ex-military man. So he was doing everything based on what his employer, the at and employees, or at and paying him under the table. We can't prove it. But you can see from the conduct of the judge, what he did was unethical, unprofessional, granting a motion for summary judgment. Now, this order went to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta. And we were given five minutes time to argue the case. I had to come, I had to come from New York to Atlanta for five minutes oral argument. This woman, Ansi Conway, she came to the court 
they filed what is called a jurisdictional statement. They alleged this is a final judgment of the court below. It was not so. The clerk had altered it and this woman argued the case and a panel of three judges affirmed without opinion. Okay? This is how things go. It's a long story, but Donald Brown, then, then they filed a false jurisdictional statement. We want to show that one. Then the 11th Circuit in case number 86-3056 issued mandate on August 29, 1986 without any opinion. You would understand the name of the game. This is not the ordinary man's understanding. You have to be a lawyer to understand the gimmicks going on here in the courts. And after Cortes was transferred to another court, new judge came. His name is Stephen D. Meriday of Tampa. He stated in his letter dated April 12 that the case was concluded by the court long time ago and the court does not have authority to reopen the case remains closed. Okay. The 11th Circuit order was issued by J.L. Edmondson on 10-1-2025 claiming that the motion to recall mandate is denied without specifically stating who, what was dismissed is not petitioner's Title Seven, ADA claims but the tender back issue, okay? There are two issues. One is a tender back where you should pay money back to the employer based on the Michigan law or not. So the, my Title Seven ADA claims were never considered by any court during the last 43 years. Okay, it's all is a gimmick. Now, Edmondson issued a second order, again denying my motion along with the Judge Marcus. Okay? I sought and bag hearing under Federal Rules of Appeal Procedure uh, 35. The Federal Rules of Civil Appeal Procedure states the case should be heard by a panel of three active judges, three active judges in all 12 Circuit Court of Appeals. But not at the 11th Circuit. They said this can be heard by a retired judge. So under the Supreme Court rules, if there is a conflict between one circuit against the 12 other circuit, rule 10 of the Supreme Court rules, the case should be heard because there is a question of who is whose advice the court has to accept. So there is a conflict. Under Rule 10 of the Supreme Court rules, it has jurisdiction and the court granted my petition. Then the game started again. Once the court issued an order, the clerk, chief clerk, Scott Hardy, should know what the court's order was. But they pretended <coughs> the case was dismissed. But if you look at paragraph, four, five and six of the Supreme Court's order, it will tell my petition for a writ of mandamus was granted and <coughs> also on page 32 of the docket sheet. We are going to show that. So this case went to the Supreme Court I filed the papers, submitted thirty three hundred dollars court fee and forty cents of brief, this high cost me around two lakhs of rupees, Indian rupees, to send it to the Supreme Court of the United States. When they got it, the first woman by the name Melissa Blarock, she returned that back to me with a fee and everything in four boxes, telling me the court to dismiss the case, citing a wrong case. She cited case number 15, 
1-9100. That was not the case upon which the Supreme Court granted permission to file a writ. When I got this back from this woman in four boxes, I sent a letter to the Chief Justice with a cover letter. He sent the fee to the clerk's office, which was received by one Jeffrey Atkins. Jeffrey Atkins corrected the case number as 169624, but he said the court dismissed the case. He can read English. The chief clerk can read the English. He is a Yale graduate, I believe, with a master's and JD degree. He couldn't understand. The only person who could understand was me and the civilized people around the globe. Okay, so this case gone on from Jeffrey Atkins three times. He refused to take it. Then there is a procedure called Rule 22 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. I'm sorry, Federal Rules, the Supreme Court Rule 22, which says you can ask one of the justices to review the decision. So I sent the fee second time, $300, and the petition requesting to submit my petition to Justice Clarence Thomas assigned to the 11th Circuit. They refused to submit to him. They returned the fee. But they had to be afraid of if they have no meritorious defense. So this went on from one kangaroo court to the other, going on. From there I took them, the lawyer, uh, Mr. Uh, Scott Harris, to the disciplinary committee of the Bar Council. They don't give it to the chief prosecutor. They give it to a woman, a lower level woman, who decided Scott Harris has the authority to reject petitions. That is not the court's order. So she returned it. Then I took them to the Columbia circuit and it went on in a cycle, a vicious circle. So the, the bottom line is I am getting a complete run around by the, the clerk's office. The justices sitting, the nine justices, they can only issue orders. There is no mechanism to let the Supreme Court of the United States to know what the heck going on. You can't communicate with the court directly. Okay? So the United States Supreme Court must sooner or later devise a machinery whereby when there is a fraud going on behind their back, how to bell the cat, how to tell the court what is going on, what is the basis the clerk of the court refused to accept the petition in the first place? What is the reason why they refused to submit my petition addressed to the Clarence Thomas Justice assigned to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals? There is no remedy. Now, three months ago, I went to Atlanta to find some law firms because most law firms in America, they don't want to do something against a major corporation because they, they know how to blacklist, blacklist. So lawyers don't take it unless they have the guts. It seems I have reasons to believe, strong reasons to believe. They were monitoring my phone lines. They were bugging everything. I sued Norton LifeLock who had a $1 million policy. I sued them in the state court. They were expelled from India. So they have reasons to believe. And I went to the cyber police. They said the people who are hacking your computers were from California, where AT&T then had their headquarters, although they now moved to Houston, Texas. OK? So it's a big game, big game. Now, every political party was involved paying bribe, okay, including President Reagan, 
who got 600,000 from this Catholic priest. He was forced to leave office in disgrace. He faced, I believe, 139 counts of felony cheating the New York City subways. But he was let off because Reagan appointed a special prosecutor and let him off the hook. Okay, so it's a long story, long, long story. I received a letter from the Department of Labor when I went to Atlanta, Georgia, three months ago. That letter shows my contribution to the employer. If you paid a contribution to the employer every month from your salary, you can forfeit it. They were telling they can't find my record after litigating 43 years. Now the Department of Labor found an employer, not the one named in my complaint, somebody else has employed me with a different number and they have taken X amount of money every month from my salary for a period of eight years. To get full pension, you only have to work five years from the employer pension. So they are playing all kinds of dirtiest tricks. I'm going to put this in the human rights issues before the world, whole world community sooner or later. Because there are people, civilized people, who understand what I am talking about. This may not be something understandable to the ordinary man and woman unless they study law, even then they make mistakes. So I am praying and waiting at the age of 84 to get a dime from the Sucker Corporation. They were ordered to deposit $8.1 billion, $8.1 billion with a B. And there is a company by the name Athena. You can't Google it. You don't know where the hell they are. Nobody knows. I have written to the at and now to tell me where this company is. Okay? So we will wait and see. Thanks. If you have any comments, any questions, send me a request. I will send you all the PDF 54 at the moment. We may have more as we research through the artificial intelligence. There are a lot of documents missing which I don't have and we may get it. So far we had more than 100 justices, judges in the Court of Appeal, Second Circuit, Eleventh Circuit, Court Below and in the Columbia Circuit went through a 16 judge panel in the Columbia Circuit Court of Appeal and Bank. So we have a lot of stuff. So I hope I will win. One day I will come out successful and we will have a movie based on this. If anybody is a producer interested in approaching me, I can give you anybody, anybody. You don't have to be a producer. Send me a request address to TR David 2009 at gmail.com or WhatsApp number 919656058330. You can send me a WhatsApp message or an email and I will send you the link which is very big. Maybe maybe around 400 pages or more. Okay? Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.